Hello, I'm Rick Sending. It's Wednesday, February 18th, 2015, here at the Eagleton Institute of Politics on the campus of Rutgers University. With me today for the Center on the American Governor is former Congressman and U.S. Senator Bob Torricelli, who can offer us a unique perspective on the personality, the politics, and the policies of Jim Florio from at least three different perspectives. First, as a colleague of former Congressman Florio in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1982 to 1989, then as an interested Washington observer of the goings-on in the administration of Governor Jim Florio in Trenton from 1990 through 1994, and still later as a prominent supporter of candidate Jim Florio's opponent, John Corzine, in the U.S. Senate primary in 2000. Bob Torricelli, welcome to Eagleton. Thank you for having me. Uh, before we get into a robust discussion of your relationship with Jim Florio, let's talk a little bit about your own background and upbringing. What was it that inspired you to get involved in politics and government? Actually, there was never a time when I didn't want to be in politics or government. It's my first memories. And I think part of that is the times in which we lived. Uh, the Cold War, the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, the beginning of the Environmental Movement. It was a time in which, if you wanted to make a difference in life, there really was no similar avenue. It was the one way to be the most effective. And of course, like any one family, in my family valued public service more than any other endeavor in life. And the combination made it inevitable. Yeah, you grew up in Republican Bergen County. I did, uh, uh, and in Republican Franklin Lakes, mm -hmm. which never elected a Democrat and, to my knowledge, never has. 19th century, 20th century, or 21st century. It's quite a streak. Not one to be proud of, but it's, it's the town in which I grew up. Although it did elect some moderate to even liberal Republicans. Dick DeCourt comes to mind as, yeah, as an example. That's, that's not enough. <laughs> um, how did you get involved in politics? When did you get involved in politics? Actually here at Rutgers. Uh, I was president of my class at, uh, in Rutgers College, and there was a gubernatorial election coming, and I thought the students in my class should see the candidates, and I hosted a, a, a forum, and one of those candidates was Brendan Byrne. Mm -hmm. And the rest is the rest say, is history. His history. Um, what did you do? Uh, how, how did you get involved with, with, with um, candidate Byrne and then governor-elect and Governor Byrne? I took a course at uh, Rutgers while I was hosting this uh, forum, and the teacher of the class was Dick Leone. And after class, I went up to him and said that uh, during spring break, I was looking for something to do and didn't have anything to do when the semester was over, and I had been a county committeeman in Bergen County and wanted to get involved. My intention was to go lick envelopes. Uh, I ended up as the campaign manager in Bergen County, not because I was good, not because I had been interviewed, not because I had special skills, because I was the only one who offered. And I took the job. Uh -huh. And uh, how then, what did you do during the Byrne administration? Uh, I, in the summer of 74, after I left college, was the Watergate year when the effort was on to take uh, the federal government. And uh, the Byrne administration made me a temporary executive director of the Democratic Party. So I did the research and the early planning and preparation for the congressional campaigns in the fall of 1974, which was the Watergate landslide. Yeah, which, interestingly enough, was the election in which uh, Jim Florio entered Congress. Correct, and, and, a, and a good number of other people. Mm -hmm. that, that class in, in Congress, some of them still remain, and I served in the House of Representatives with many of them because mm -hmm. they were the biggest class of Democrats, I think, in the history of the Congress. Did you have occasion to come into contact with Florio during the 74 campaign? I did. When I graduated from college and, and ran the party that summer, I ran the research project, and we did basic research on all the Democrats running for Congress on their Republican opponents. And I remember meeting with Jim Florio and Andy McGuire and a host of other people and presenting them with everything we had found on their opponents. Mm -hmm. And that was Congressman Hunt? Was that the... It was the, Congressman the, Hunt. Uh, Jim had run against him two years before unsuccessfully mm -hmm. and was wise enough to see that the atmosphere had changed. And Jim had learned to be a better candidate. Uh, he had developed a stronger reputation, and he had the wind to his back, as they say. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, I know that I, I mean, we could go into great detail about the, your work with Vice President Mondale, uh, running the um, Carter-Mondale campaign in Illinois, uh, and a variety of other activities, but let's get up to 1982 when you okay. decided to throw your own hat in the ring. Um, how did you decide that that particular district at that particular time was ripe for your taking? Well, having lived in Bergen County all my life, I, I, I watched the county and I knew the towns. I had seen Andy McGuire succeed in uh, 74 in the Northern District of Bergen County and watched Henry Helstosky as a congressman in the Southern District in, in Bergen County. Um, I, I was not surprised that Andy McGuire could not hold the seat in the North. He was a product of the Watergate landslide and at some point it was going to return to a Republican district. I wanted a stronger base. If I was going to elect to Congress, I wanted to be uh, more progressive, certainly more challenging on issues, and wanted a stronger base if I wanted to run for statewide office. And that was the southern part that was of the southern district, County, which, which was is the, more the center collar. of the southern. Mm -hmm. And of course, Helstowski then left the, the Congress. He was defeated and, and left the Congress. Uh, and I established a residence in New Milford in the center of the county. And the Republican incumbent at that point was Hollenbeck, Hollenbeck who had been one term. He had he come in on Reagan's coattails in 80? He, he, no, he had won in uh, 76. He had been in for oh. six years. Mm -hmm. He'd been for six years, and when he won in 80, uh, he had had a very high vote, I thought artificially high, because of the Reagan landslide. So other people were not looking at the nomination. I thought those numbers weren't real, mm -hmm. and I started running for the nomination. And um, was there was there a primary, or were you the only? There again, was not, were you the only Democrat who was? No, I, there, there actually there was a, a minor uh, primary. For all practical purposes, I had the nomination. Mm -hmm. um, I think people it wasn't about my being strong. I think other people weren't paying enough attention. Uh, first, Hollenbeck's numbers, as I thought, I said, were inflated. And second, there had been redistricting. And so Hollenbeck was looked upon as a strong incumbent. In fact, 60% of the district was new to him. In most of the district, he was not an incumbent. Uh, but fortunately for me, I think nobody else seemed to notice. How much involvement did you have in the redistricting activity? I did, uh, through Byron Bear. Byron mm -hmm. Bear mm -hmm. tended to be doing the redistricting in the state of New Jersey, simply because he was the smartest. Mm -hmm. He knew the process the best and he was the most computer savvy, which in those days was not common. And it was getting very hard to draw these districts to Supreme Court standards on one man, one vote. I should point out that Byron Bear was a Democratic assemblyman from Bergen County. He was, uh, and a very bright fellow, and had almost a monopoly on the, on the wisdom of how to do this in compliance with the court. And Byron and I had been friends for years. He wanted to see me in the Congress for ideological reasons and personal. And he, did, he drew the district and improved it considerably to my mm -hmm. advantage. So you get to Washington in 1983 as a freshman congressman. Jim Florio has now been there for four terms, I guess. Uh, it's no secret that um, congressmen from the same state uh, often are rivals, often don't get along, um, even if they're... or even perhaps even more so if they're of the same party. Um, that certainly is the case with the United States senators. Maybe we'll get to that later. Um, but you and Jim Florio seemed to hit it off from day one. Why? We did, and, and you're right. Congressmen of the same state don't usually get along well. Um, and in my case with Jim, it might not have been a good relationship because I had been part of the Brendan Burns gubernatorial administration. I was the chief of staff for his reelection campaign, uh, and Jim Flora was our rival. So well, indeed, we, one, one, of, one, of, one many. of many. So we very well might not have gotten along. But we became friends. I uh, admired his work on the environment. Environmental issues were the most important to me, and that was also an important part of his career. That was part of our relationship. Second, although we were both Italian-American Democrats from New Jersey and with ambitions and might have been rivals, there was a bit of a generational difference. He had already run for governor. He was seeming about to again. I was somewhat younger. So I, some of the rivalry was taken away from that. And he was from South Jersey and I was from North Jersey. 
and our personalities were very different. Uh, Jim never aspired to be a player within the House of Representatives. Uh, his future was New Jersey. He kept to his committee. He was very serious about his substantive work. And I was much more involved in Washington and congressional politics. So while we had things in common, the things that were different about us, I think, avoided rivalry. Well, you, uh, uh, particularly in your early career, specialized primarily in foreign affairs, as I recall. I did. Uh, I was very involved in foreign policy, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was very involved in House politics and Washington politics. And those were never things of interest to Jim. Mm -hmm. So were there particular uh, areas, uh, you mentioned the environment, but were there spe specific bills or specific initiatives that the two of you worked on together? Well, I was dependent upon him because my district in southern New Jersey included the Meadowlands and some of the worst uh, toxic sites, not only in New Jersey, but in the country. And I was very involved in getting some of them fixed. We had a terrible thorium problem in Maywood and Rochelle Park. We had mercury problems uh, in, in Rutherford and in and Lyndhurst. Uh, these were very important to me. And Jim was writing the legislation. And this gave was the me, Superfund legislation. Superfund legislation. Yeah. And Jim gave me a lot of advice about getting it fixed. He and Bob Rowe really shepherded my career in being effective in getting things done for Bergen County. Mm -hmm. um, as you progressed through those first two or three terms in Congress, and it was clear that Jim Florio was going to run for governor in 1989. Did you uh, support him? Did you work with him? Did you work on his campaign? Well, before that, it actually was appeared that Jim Florio was going to run for governor in 1985. Because you remember, he lost extremely narrowly to Tom Kane. Mm -hmm. And while we now all think of Tom Kane as being invincible and this enormous political force, in fact, the first couple of years of Tom Kane's administration, he wasn't doing so well. Mm -hmm. There was a bad national recession. His polling was not strong. And I, proved out was wrong, had urged Jim to run in 85. Uh, Jim thought He that wisely was, did not take your advice. He wisely <laughs> did not take my advice. He thought Kane would recover. Mm -hmm. I did not. He was right. I was mm -hmm. wrong. Jim thought I was also encouraging him to run for governor so I'd get him out of the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that may have been in the back of my head, but it was not at the forefront. I actually wanted to run because I thought at the time he'd be effective and the better governor. Mm -hmm. um, I do think he'd be the better governor, but I, but I was wrong. He would not have won. Um, you have often spoken, I've, I've read uh, some of the interviews that you've done, about your own fiscal conservatism. Um, socially liberal, but, um, but fiscally conservative. Uh, that would seem to put you somewhat at odds with Jim Florio's uh, fiscal philosophy. Did you ever have occasion to uh, have disagreements on this subject? I don't remember arguing with him, but our voting records were different. You know, we are who we are, and Jim was a product of Camden, and he, uh, he proudly uh, hails from a family where his father was a, was a worker in a, in a shipyard, and he grew up in modest circumstances. I proudly came from Franklin Lakes, New Jersey, in a very different socioeconomic circumstances. I think we're both proud of our backgrounds, but we are who we are. And I grew up being conscious of taxation and what it did to communities and, uh, and approach public life that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but you never had conflicts that you would speak of in that regard? No, you know, and I, I've, um, it may not have been the right, in fact, I think about what votes in life in many years in Congress I cast that were wrong and I actually voted against the Social Security compromise of that uh, President Reagan and Tip O'Neill had come because of increased taxes precipitously. In retrospect, that probably was the wrong vote. I did vote for the balanced budget uh, initiative of Bill Clinton that balanced the federal budget, which was a tax increase. I think that was the only significant tax increase I ever voted for in my life, mm -hmm. but it was about balancing the federal budget, and I think it was the right thing to do. It, um Boy, we can go back to, 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 to that answer later when we talk about the changing nature of politics in America. Um, but for now, let's go back to 1989, and, and now Florio is running. Uh, he's running against another of your colleagues, although on the opposite, uh, from the opposite political spectrum, uh, Jim Corder. Um, how, a fellow I admired a lot, uh, still uh, do, and is a close personal friend. Really? Um, how had, had you worked closely or had you worked with him even across the aisle when you were in Congress together? Uh, Jim Corder and I worked very closely together because I was the Democrat on the Foreign Relations Committee and uh, he was the Republican on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, the overlap of jurisdictions was considerable mm -hmm. 
And I had developed a philosophy of being effective in foreign policy by also knowing military matters. Uh, Jim was effective in military matters because he also knew something about foreign policy. So we spent a lot of time together. And I had been very supportive of some of the rearmament programs in the 1980s for the United States as we were rebuilding the American military. And that had us work together considerably. And mm -hmm. I admired Jim. Do you, do you think that in some respects you were more politically close to Quarter than you were to Florio? I think I was personally probably closer to Jim Quarter, and I was closer to him certainly on foreign policy and military matters. But again, what I had admired so much about Jim Florio is his commitment on environmental issues, which was my other passion and mm -hmm. remains so. So the 89 election, you, you, I mean, obviously you'd have been personally pleased with either outcome from the standpoint of what your relationship with the incoming governor would be. Uh, I was, but, but since New Jersey was unlikely to have a foreign policy or a strong military, <laughs> uh, but environmental issues were central, mm -hmm. as were education issues, Jim Florio was the right choice. And, and you I were threw myself heart and soul into it. And you were unlikely to wish a Republican governor on the That state. too. Um, so did you actively, were you actively involved in the 89 campaign? I encouraged Jim from the outset uh, and I, I thought he would, would win it. I thought he'd be a good governor. I thought it was the right moment for him to be governor. And uh, if memory serves me correctly, I actually put together the first money. I remember when we had to put together the first polling and the first budget, I, I, I could be wrong, but I think it all came from my operations. Really? So, so you were still a political operative at heart. I was an M. <laughs> um, as that campaign progressed and it became fairly clear that Florio was going to win, did you and he, or you and any of his people, have conversations about what, what the government initiatives were going to be when he was elected? You know, we didn't. And, I've, and I've, Jim and I have remained close friends, but I probably had unrealistic expectations. My sense was is that Jim and I were very close friends, and his election was very important. And I thought I had played a larger role than anybody in the delegation, in fact, than everybody in the delegation. And I really wanted to stay involved. And I was very frustrated that I was not after he became governor. But I think it was extremely unrealistic. You can't be in Washington, be serving in Congress, and be an element in the running of the state of New Jersey government. Mm -hmm. It's just, it was, it was immature and naive of me. But I, my feelings were hurt. I wanted to be involved in the administration. It just wasn't possible. I, I had other responsibilities, and I just wasn't there day to day. And running the government of the state of New Jersey is a minute-by-minute -minute affair. It certainly is, and it certainly was for the first six months of that administration, uh, which you watched from the discreet distance of Washington. But you certainly must have had some opinions about the assault weapons ban, about the auto insurance reform, about the uh, changing of the school funding formula, and ultimately about the substantial tax increases that came along all within the first six months. I did, and you know, there's no one closer to the people and the public sentiment than a member of the House of Representatives, because you run every two years, you're on the streets all the time. Uh, if the wind blows, you feel it. And I felt it. Um, Many of those issues, I was very sympathetic with Jim. The assault weapon ban was the right thing to do. I think the country painfully through these years has learned that uh, lesson. The school funding uh, formula, um, it was a, a moral and a legal obligation in this state to assure the quality of education of every child. In my mind, it was not a legitimately debatable issue. It simply had to be done. Uh, the state had fiscal challenges. Uh, Jim met them the way he thought was best to do. I don't think with Jim it was as, as much a substantive issue as that the sale of the program, the explanation for it, was obviously not done well. I think history uh, supports that, that conclusion. Politics is a complex piece of business. Uh, it, it's a set of beliefs. It's a deep knowledge. It's a conviction to achieve but it's also a set of skills to prepare the public. Um, as I think Lincoln said, you need to lead the public, but not by too much. You can just be so far out front of the public. You need to bring them along, sometimes kicking and screaming, 
but always with a base of knowledge. A lot of people whom we have interviewed have, have uh, talked about Tom Kane's approach, where he did, in fact, um, sign tax increases, kicking and screaming, uh, and Jim Florio's ap approach, which was full speed ahead. Uh, one of the distinctions here is, is that uh, Florio evidently acted on the belief that he had political capital, spend it in those first six months, and then spend the next three and a half years building it back up again, knowing that there would be this kind of reaction, but perhaps not anticipating the extent of the reaction. Do you think that's an accurate assessment? Here's how I look at this, in fairness, because I admire Tom Kane and I admire Jim Florio. They could not be different individuals. Tom Kane led, and perhaps appropriately, incrementally. He saw where he was, he knew where he wanted the state to go, and he was going to get there step by step. That's not Jim Florio. He saw where he was, he knew where he wanted to go, and he wanted to get there in a hurry. Uh, and if it wasn't revolutionary, it certainly wasn't incremental. Uh, they had different outcomes. You can argue which is better. Uh, Tom Kane did what he did, succeeded politically and substantively. Jim Florio succeeded substantively. He did not succeed politically. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't fault him for trying. And in, in politics, there's a moral imperative to do as much as you can possibly do in the short time you are given. And he tried, and I admire that. There are a number of people also whom we've interviewed who uh, have basically uh, described Jim Florio as a policy wonk. Uh, much, much more interested than most elected politicians in the substance of the and detail of the policies that he's working on. Was that your impression as well? Yeah, I think that's true. I, and the, the things that Jim worked on in the, the Congress, there were some health care issues, there was the environmental issues, the asbestos issues, the insurance issues. I think he knew them as well as anyone in the Congress. And I think that was important for him when he became governor. So I think that's true. He was certainly policy, uh, policy driven, mm -hmm. uh, much more than he was politically driven. And his policy skills were greater than his political skills, I'll say gently. <laughs> you had uh, mentioned earlier that um, a U.S. congressman, being so close to the people, gets that blowback, gets that feedback. What kind of blowback and feedback were you getting in 1991, um, early 92, heading into your uh, upcoming election? Well, the best way to answer that is I ran for the House of Representatives seven times, and there was only one of them where I was really concerned about the outcome. And that and was, it was 1992. That uh, I didn't have anything to do with state policy. I didn't vote on the tax increase. I, I wouldn't spend any time in Trenton. No, but you'd seen what happened to Bill Bradley in 1990. But what happened to Bill Bradley didn't just happen to Bill Bradley. It happened to the rest of us. Mm -hmm. The public was mad, and the only people on the ballot were members of Congress, and we may not have had any involvement, but it was the only way to express yourself. So it was the 90 election that would have been the toughest one for you, not 92, or perhaps both of them. It was 90. Yeah, 90. okay. Um, did the hands across New Jersey movement that sprouted up during this time and made life so difficult for, for uh, Jim Florio and his administration, did that show up in, in your reelection oh, campaign? Oh, well, definitely, because the only people on the ballot were federal. And the only way to be heard was to uh, be heard against us. So I, I did hear about it. And, mm -hmm. and you know, in, 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 in fairness, the hands across New Jersey and a lot of that, which people were talking about being a revolt on taxes, really was about the assault weapon ban. It was funded by the gun lobby. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have the courage to come out and fight on their own issue. So they just spent money uh, believing they cared about taxes and spending. In fact, they were trying to hurt anyone who was for banning guns. Did you know that at the time? Oh, yes, yeah. Oh. Okay, because a lot of the people that we've talked to say they didn't understand that that was what was happening at the no. time, but well, much later. Jim Florio knew where it was coming from, and if you were paying strong attention, you knew where this was. Mm -hmm. That's where the money was coming from. So, um, so during the time that Florio was governor, you said that you, your feelings were kind of hurt um, because you, you weren't um, asked for your opinion and advice as often as, uh, as you might have liked to be. But you did have uh, some, some close friends and some people who had, uh, Jamie Foxx comes to mind as someone who had worked for you. 
who was now deputy chief of staff in the Florida administration. Yeah, we had a lot so of common a, staff, actually, and I, and I, you know, I felt included in the administration. It's just the idea that because Jim and I were close and we cared about the same issues that it have an impact on day-to-day -day policy was unrealistic. You can't govern the state of New Jersey that way, and I had my own responsibilities. But we certainly shared a lot of staff and shared beliefs and tried to be as helpful as I could because Jim was doing good things for the state of New Jersey. I mean, mm -hmm. I would argue today uh, it would be a good thesis for someone to write the issues that face New Jersey today, the fact we've never squarely dealt with our educational problems, the environmental agenda has never really been finished, and our fiscal problems are now legendary. Mm -hmm. What if Jim had a second term? Or what if the, uh, the activities that he did during his first term hadn't been repealed? Both. Uh, one could argue the state of New Jersey would be a very different place today, economically and politically. Mm -hmm. um, when he lost in 93, do I have my years right? Yeah, I do. 93. Um, and Christy Whitman came in. What kind of relationship did you then have with the head off with, with, the, with the state government apparatus? Did it change dramatically because you were of different parties? You know, it really didn't. I, I think by the time we were into 93 and 94, I was the only member of the House Democrat of my generation. The other Democrats had been around a long time. They were committee chairmen. They were getting older. Uh, and I was the only one really deeply involved in the House leadership day-to-day -day in the agenda of the Congress. And uh, Governor Whitman's administration relied upon me a fair amount to carry the agenda as a Democrat, uh, to the extent it was required on my side of the aisle. Mm -hmm. So we actually had a very close relationship. Uh, I also was very supportive of Governor Whitman as governor because she also shared my passion for open space, uh, which in addition to the environmental issues that Jim Florio pursued was the other thing I felt so strongly about. And she was very good on open space. Mm -hmm. Um, fast forward to 2000, where I guess for the second time you're going to come into some conflict with Jim Florio. I hadn't, I, I, it hadn't occurred to me that that midterm or that the, the second burn uh, election would have been a source of some tension or conflict with, with Jim. But clearly 2000 was, uh, because you were a prominent supporter of John Corzine in the, Repo in the Democratic primary for U.S. Senate? Well, the decision in 2000 to nominate a, to the United States Senate a, a candidate who could win was, was complex. Uh, I was chairman of the campaign committee uh, for the Senate, mm -hmm. responsible for raising the money and doing the recruitment. And we were six seats away from getting a Democratic majority. And getting a Democratic majority was essential we did not know whether Al Gore was going to win the presidency or it would be George Bush. If it was going to be George Bush, we had to have a Democratic Senate. If it was going to be Al Gore, we certainly wanted him to be as effective as Bill Clinton and have that majority. It was my job to find six seats. The problem with 2000 is that there were seats open in California. Uh, Moynihan did not run for re-election. Hillary was running. We had New York. We had Florida. We had Michigan and Pennsylvania. You couldn't have a worse lineup for open seats. They were all multi-million dollar campaigns. Yeah, open Democratic seats. Open Democratic right. seats. And very expensive. So uh, one of the reasons that we recruited Hillary is she was a self-funder. In fact, she's a profit center. She would raise more <laughs> than, than she could spend. Uh, but then, lo and behold, Lautenberg does not run for election, and we have New Jersey. We just didn't have the money. Flat out. We but, didn't have the money. But you had a state where a, a an, in, in, for, for Congress, or for, I'm sorry, for the United States Senate, there had not been a Republican win since 1972. You still need to spend 15, 20 million dollars for the candidate. And that $15, $20 million was better spent elsewhere in the country getting people elected. Mm -hmm. John Corzine came forward, was interested in running for the Senate. I had known John for years. Uh, I knew him as chairman of Goldman Sachs. He'd been a very good supporter of mine through the years. I knew he was smart. He was very, very focused. He was prepared to fund his own race. 
His polling was very positive based on his profile. I thought he could hold the seat. I thought he could hold the seat and allow us to spend the resources to get elect Hillary elected. Debbie Stabenow in Michigan, Bill Nelson in, uh, in Florida, reelect Dianne Feinstein in California. Uh, and I was right. They all worked except we lost Pennsylvania. Otherwise, we won every one of those seats and we got a majority by one seat. Mm -hmm. So it uh, may have been the right decision, may have been wrong, but it got us the Democratic majority in the United States Senate, Did which with George Bush winning the presidency became critical. You, um, so you're, you're thinking now of the whole question of the New Jersey seat as one of many nationally. You're not thinking that of it my specifically job. as as that was my job as your own state. Did this? Um, did you and Florio ever have occasion to talk about this? Did you ever uh, uh, discuss? Your we did, role there? but always civilly. Uh, Jim came to me early and said that he had wanted to to run. I had told him that John Corzine had an interest, and I told him of my financial concern, what it meant for the party and control of the uh, of the Senate. Uh, he was determined to run. I did suggest to him I did not think it was a very good idea. I told him I would not endorse either, and I never did, though it was clear that for my responsibilities getting control of the Senate, uh, we're better served by Corzine being the candidate. So am I incorrect in referring to you as a prominent supporter of Corzine? Yeah, I, 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 I clearly helped him, but I did not endorse him. Okay. Um, let's talk about your, how you view Jim Florio's governorship from the perspective of all the different governors that you've seen. You started working for Brendan Byrne. Uh, you were um, involved, uh, you were in, in, in national office throughout Tom Kane's administration. Um, you knew Florio well. You just said that you had worked closely with, uh, with the Whitman administration. Uh, then you had uh, McGreevy, you had Corzine, whom, whom you've known for a long time. How would you compare and contrast them, uh, their leadership styles, their um, talents, their shortcomings, uh, for each of those governor, mm. gov governors? Well, Jim Florio clearly had the courage of convictions more than anyone has served as governor of Jersey. He had the, the political determination and courage of Brendan Byrne but probably without the same level of political skills. Uh, but he had a, a determination to achieve and to do so in a short order that most of the other governors, even good governors who stood for the right things, were probably more patient or more willing to compromise. Uh, which of those is the most virtuous? <laughs> I'll leave to others to decide, but I admired his courage. What do you think his legacy will be? You know, I've, I ask an honest question, I'll give you an honest answer. Um, missed opportunity. I think Jim uh, presented an agenda. He was an opportunity that was missed by the state of New Jersey. Uh, had he been reelected, had he succeeded politically, the state would be a different place today. And many of the debates we're now having about our abysmal fiscal health the continuing failure to address our educational difficulties, we wouldn't be having all those debates, at least not to the same degree. You briefly toyed with the idea of being governor. You very briefly. What, 12 days, I think, was yeah. to it. Very brief. Um, why? No, not why did you toy with the idea, why didn't you pursue it? Uh, it was very complex. One, I was chairman of the campaign committee of the Senate, and when uh, Various political leaders in New Jersey suggested to me that uh, Jim McGree may have some vulnerabilities and might not be the strongest nominee. Uh, I went to the Senate leadership, Senator Daschle, and suggested that I had an interest in it. But he reminded me I was also chairman of the campaign committee, responsible for getting control of the Senate back. Um, I suggested I thought it was something that might be able to be done in rather short order. The election wasn't for another year. If I could secure the nomination early, it wouldn't necessarily be a conflict with my duties. And I pursued it with that in mind. That did not afford me the opportunity to run a primary. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I could have just simply run a primary the next year. It was not practical with my responsibilities in the Senate. And I know to this day, friends and supporters, people say to me, 
why didn't you pursue it? Why didn't you go ahead and just run the primary? I would love to have. I couldn't. It, it was not responsible in, with my duties in the Senate. It also sounds to me, based upon your activities when you were in Congress, in the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, and, and dealing with an awful lot of national and international issues and big picture federal stuff, um, that it lent itself more to your moving on to the Senate than it would for you coming you know, back Rick, to the You know, Rick, there's some government. truth in that, and that my passion had been uh, foreign policy. I knew the, my greatest impact in the Congress was foreign policy issues and military issues, because I had spent so many years traveling the globe, meeting foreign leaders, studying, reading, being a part of the formation of American foreign policy. I pursued it with passion, and I, I hope I made a difference for our country. I certainly wanted to. But I also lived here, and I had come of age in New Jersey politics and in the State House. And in the federal government, in the Congress generally, you can touch policy, you can impact policy, but you can't grab it by the throat and drag it forward. Mm -hmm. There is no position in the United States like the governorship of any major state. The governorship allows you to wrestle an issue to the ground, pin it, and pull it into a different time, uh, whether it's education or the environment or economic development. It is an entirely different ability to impact people's lives and, 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 and change the future. Uh, and I regret not having done that at some point in my life. I wish that I had, because when you see people who have done it and done it well, they've changed lives, not by the handful, but by the millions. Did you ultimately get frustrated being one of 435, uh, and is that what caused you to want to become one of 100? I, you know, my decision uh, to want to be uh, a senator and my decision ultimately to leave public life are, are related, in that um, I never wanted to be in Congress all my life. There are people I loved and admired, like Peter Rodino, who, who came out of the service as a young man and spent his entire life there. I, I really respect that. And there are many people who do it today. That wasn't me. I, I wanted to have many lives. And I wanted a life as a congressman. I wanted a life as a senator. But then I wanted a life as a businessman. I wanted a life as a, as a citizen. Uh, I, didn't want my, I didn't want to be defined by a job. And I, I spent 20 years. So after 14 in the House of Representatives, I thought, that was enough. Mm -hmm. And I'll go to the Senate. And I, I, my plan probably was to spend two terms in the, in the Senate. But then, you know, as things, I, I wasn't enjoying it anymore. It was time to go to private life. And 20 years was just enough. So the decision to become a senator was like the decision to retire. It was just enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. And tell us what you've been doing since you've been in public, in, out of public life. You know, I've actually had that rare... Uh, bit of good fortune in life to have every stage of life exactly the way I wanted it. As a young man, I wanted to work for the governor. I wanted to be a White House staffer. I enjoyed the experience, and I did it, and I left it at the right time. I wanted to be a young congressman and be involved in American foreign policy in the Cold War and, uh, and, and, and to learn the world and to learn the country. And I did that for 14 years, and I enjoyed it, and I'm glad I did it. I did the same with the Senate, and I enjoyed being involved in national politics. And then I always wanted to retire and make some money and have a farm and have horses. And I, I wanted to live a more comfortable life, a private life, away from the spotlight and the media and politics. And I started building a real estate portfolio. And I renovate properties and build residential uh, multifamily housing. And I have a consulting practice that takes me around the globe occasionally to stay involved in foreign policy and business issues. And I've really enjoyed it. Tell us about that consulting. What kind of consulting takes you around the world? Well, I've been, I've been giving advice for several foreign governments during the last 10 years. And I'm very involved now with the expatriate community that is in opposition to the Iranian government. It takes me to the Middle East a good deal, and I do that. But... It also represents some Fortune 500 companies and some real estate developers in New Jersey. So what I loved about public life is every day was different. You got up in the morning and you could be dealing with a situation in Kuwait 
or I could be dealing with a bridge that was down in Paramus. And I loved the uncertainty of every day and the mix of issues. And I feel like I've done that in my private life. I One day I get up and the heat is out on one of my buildings and uh, or I need to renegotiate a lease. But that afternoon I could be getting a call and there's an issue about the expatriate Iranian community in Iraq <laughs> and that they're being attacked by the Iranians and we need to do something about it. Or I could have a problem for a New Jersey real estate developer that's got a problem with a the town or the DOT and needs to get it developed and is trying to build something important. I love the mix that every hour is different. Are you skeptical of President Obama's uh, um, overtures toward Iran? Enormously. I think one of the great charms of America, one of the most endearing qualities, is that it is young and vibrant and naive. And one of the things that scares me about America and discourages me is that it is young, vibrant, and naive. Uh, you're seeing both with regard to Iran. I think the idea that we're going to reach a nuclear accord with the Iranians is fanciful. And I think the not taking a position against their encroachment in Iraq, they're now their dominance of Iraq, has enormous long-term dangers. Aligning with them now in the fight against ISIS, I, I think, is extremely dangerous. You also had some very harsh words to say about Cuba over the years. Uh, do you feel that the initiative toward Cuba is similarly naive? Well, you know, I don't regret having been the author of the second round after the Kennedy round of the Cuban embargo. I'm very proud of what I did. It is now summarily written in every paper in America that it was a failure because the president says so, and so we have to abandon the policy. Was it a failure? When we enacted it, the Cubans were involved in armed struggle in Angola and Mozambique. Uh, they were involved in Salvador, Colombia, Nicaragua, and a host of other places. That didn't go away by chance. Uh, the Cuban embargo and American isolation of the Cuban government weakened them, contained them, allowed the revolution to mature, uh, clearly became less offensive. Is it time now for a change of policy toward Cuba? Probably. It is a more complex situation. I think we defanged them, and at least what they were attempting to do in our hemisphere in revolution, militarily. It's probably a different time for a different approach. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't retain our principles. I do not believe that the United States should have an identical policy for democratic nations that respect human rights, respect the will of the governed, and those that are totalitarian and abuse human rights. We can have some economic intercourse and political intercourse with both, but the policy should not be identical. Cuba should remain in a different relationship with the United States as long as Cuba chooses to be different in how it treats its people. Mm -hmm. And. Um I assume you feel the same applies to Saudi Arabia and other countries that are uh, um, in America's sphere of influence, but not necessarily uh, as I, I, I supportive do. of human I rights. I do. I think we have a level of relationship with the great democracies. Uh, NATO is not only the most successful political and military alliance in, in history, it is the most admirable. You must be a democratic nation to be a member. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter how much you serve our interests, you must be democratic to be a member. Uh, we should weigh them differently. Other states can be helpful to us, in the Middle East or in Latin America. They can have aligned interests. They can serve our purposes. But I think to get in the inner sanctum of trust with the United States, where you get our most advanced weapons, our best intelligence, our complete best wishes, our commitment to defend each other, you need to be in that circle of democracy. We've come quite a ways away from our discussion of Jim Florio. Let me just get back to it for a second and ask you to pretty much wrap this up. Um, what didn't I ask you that I should have? Or what observations would you have to make about Jim Florio that we haven't discussed? I, you know, I, if you wanted to segue Jim Florio into a discussion we're all going to have for the next couple of years in New Jersey, it would be if Jim Florio were a candidate or governor today, given his courage, uncompromising courage on policy to do the right thing, what would he do? And I think the greatest contribution Jim Florio could make to those who now aspire to be governor would be simply this. 
running for public office is not fun. Being in public office is not fun. I'm an expert on both of those. <laughs> Just do the right thing. Whether it is about taxation or spending or dealing with the pension problems, dealing with our endemic transportation educational problems, do the right thing. And if it doesn't work out politically, life goes on. Public life is a stage of life. You get reins of power, do the best you can, make the greatest contribution you can. If it works politically, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But you walk away from it saying, I tried to bring everybody in the right direction. I think you pretty much described the Florio administration. I'd like to describe the next administration. <laughs> well, on that note, thanks Thank very you. much. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed it.